Thank you very much for joining the newcomers talk tonight. Um, it, it, you, if, if you are a newcomer or have uh, been to sessions of ours before, you will probably know our international Stammtisch as a format which we've been running over 20 years now. Over the last few months, we've been running it online as a Zoom session or as YouTube, sometimes whenever possible, even in hybrid format when we had participants in the room. Tonight we've moved to total Zoom and I'm very delighted and glad to see so many familiar faces joining um, and welcome back to International Stammtisch and in this case tonight to a newcomer's talk. We have two incredible guests with us uh, tonight and I'm, I'm really happy and delighted to welcome uh, Patricia Lashina who is the uh, Consul General of the US in Frankfurt. Uh, good evening Patricia, good to have you on the call. And we have Corina Rada, who is the principal of, uh, of uh, International School Frankfurt, uh, Rhine Main, because it's a larger surrounding. And uh, Corina, we've met in the school already. Good to have you on the call as well. Thank you for your time. Really, very much appreciated. Um, in the format tonight, we have decided to take a decision, we, we decided to, to talk about a specific subject. If you followed our discussions before, we had open formats, just meeting people. And, and tonight we thought it would be very interesting to specifically focus on leadership skills and, and talk about leadership. Uh, if we have two um, excellent example of women in leadership positions in the rhine main area, we will take the opportunity to learn a lot from them, but also to discuss and understand what makes a successful leadership, what are successful leadership skills, and to learn from their experiences and their organizations. Uh, to, to start off tonight, I would ask both of you to shortly introduce yourself, give a couple of information about yourself, but we would also like to understand since when you are in Frankfurt and perhaps a little bit about your organization, the school, obviously the US consulate. Uh, Patricia, if you want to start, uh, we would be delighted. And you are on mute right now, let me help you. Okay, is, can you hear me now? Excellent, working now. Okay. okay, so um, thank you for the invitation. I'm really, really happy to be here, Arun. Um, and my distinguished colleague, I'm excited to hear from her as well. Um, I was just telling her earlier that my daughter actually attended the ISF for two years, so I know it well. I am, uh, many people don't know, I have been a diplomat for 32 years, but previous to that, I actually was a teacher at an international school. So I feel that that is uh, super preparation for leadership across the board in any kind of forum and in any kind of setting. So I'm very lucky to have had that experience. I have served all around the world. I actually was in Frankfurt before from 2006 to 2008 working um, as a facilitator for training and competency building for some of our smaller embassies in the region. I spent two years here. I really enjoyed it. My daughter loved it here. She has come back often. We usually come to the Christmas markets. So very sad there were none this year. Mm. Um, and uh, I have worked all around the world with the Foreign Service. I started in Argentina and have gone all the way around and back to Washington in my 32 year career. Before I came out here as the Consul General, which was two and a half years ago, I'm sadly in the last six months of my tour, I worked for Secretary John Kerry uh, in the State Department as one of the uh, deputy executive uh, leaders. So um, I did a lot with his domestic travel and preparation of, you know, briefings and paperwork and, you know, supervising all, I supervised all the IT team from the people who traveled with him on the airplane to people who gave us our phones and made sure that we had the latest technology. So I have, I have done a, a lot of different jobs. I've worked in uh, UN organizations as an office director, and I have worked as a deputy chief information officer. So my, my career is quite challenging. Record. Um, and so I've done a lot of different things, leading very different kinds of teams. 
Um, so I'm happy to discuss that with, with you all. I hope that answers everything. I'm married, I'm married to a, retire, a newly retired Foreign Service Officer. Okay. He's an IT, uh, IT specialist, but they've already called him back and he's currently working in Mauritania for two months. Um, and my daughter uh, is working in New York. She graduated from college and she's working in New York. So, and I'm here in Frankfurt. Excellent, welcome again. Thank you, uh, Patricia, for the introduction. We'll talk about the organization within a moment. Give Corina a short moment to introduce sure. herself as well. Thank you, Matt. thanks so much. Corina. Hello, yes, my name is Karina Rader. Like you said, thank you so much for inviting me to the event. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I have been in Frankfurt a little over a year now. I came from Stockholm, Sweden. In Stockholm, Sweden, I was head of schools at an international school. And uh, then we moved to Frankfurt first for my husband's job, but initially, looking for schools and uh, for my three children and found ISF and it fit all the needs. I too was looking for a school with the pool and ISF was the only school that had a pool. And I also was looking for a curriculum that was pretty regimented and uh, well aligned with the state standards because I'm a US citizen as well as very internationally uh, fit and minded as well, uh, because we're also Swedish citizens. So uh, ISF met both of those needs. And then knowing that we were going to be relocating to Frankfurt, I started to look for jobs, just curiosity looking on their job board. And I found that they had a director's position that was open. So I applied and I got the job as a school director and we actually ended up moving before my husband even signed his contract to move to Frankfurt. So I like to say that we moved here for me. <laughs> but uh, So now I've been there about a year, uh, two months after I started as a director at a very new big school, 750 students and 150 staff, uh, COVID came. And so I quickly uh, had to adapt. And I think as we all have, um, learn new ways of doing things. And for school, that meant turning everything online. Um, but I can tell you about that later as we get into the discussion. Uh, so in short, yeah, I've got a husband and I've got three young daughters, one in third grade, fifth grade and eighth grade. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Corina. And within the first year in Frankfurt, you still say welcome to Frankfurt. But uh, with, with so many foreigners from all over the world being in Frankfurt, there's hardly anybody originally from Frankfurt. And we're very liberal about making everybody a Frankfurter fairly quickly. So you, you're on the best way. Um, thank you for, for sharing. And I can really imagine that starting your, your new job in this crazy time, extremely in a school with so many challenges must have been a time. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hear more about that. Uh, Corina just mentioned, obviously, both ladies just talked about the pool at your school. Uh, you just <laughs> mentioned that it, it, is, it is a fairly big school with over eight, around 800 pupils. Is that correct? Yes, unfortunately, with COVID, the enrollment did it, dip a little yeah. bit. People were brought back to their home yeah. countries. Yeah, and and just just to understand the size, how how, how many in staff do you have uh, working with you? A hundred and fifty. 147 to be oh, exact. Good, perfect. <laughs> so when we talk about leadership, that is that is good to know, uh, Patricia. Understanding a little bit about the size and the and the the how big the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt, U.S. consulate general in Frankfurt is, I, I read it's one of the biggest worldwide. Actually, the biggest. I'm not sure. Help us. So it's the largest consulate uh, worldwide. Um, it goes back and forth between fourth, fifth, sixth largest installation uh, okay. worldwide that the State Department has overseas. Um, so it, you know, it kind of depends uh, whether we've put more people somewhere or fewer people. Um, we've had a bit of change in staffing here just due to prioritization. Um, and some one office actually closed uh, a year and a half ago, small office, but still, you know, so there are always ebbs and flows to staffing. Okay. I would say we, we have around a thousand employees. Okay. 
uh, probably 375 in thereabouts that are locally engaged. So we're very unique because um, we have probably between a third and a half of our locally employed uh, staff is actually American. They're actually American citizens. So that's very unique only to, to Frankfurt actually. Okay. Um, so, um, and, the rest and that brings with it, there are many, many Germans, but okay. I think we have 36 nationalities on our staff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Either, you know, people who are immigrants, their parents, uh, you know, people who are working here temporarily because they're EU citizens and they can come, you know, one of our latest hires in one of the offices, we got him from Dublin, you know, he's Irish. Okay. So, you know, that is, we, we are able to, um, the EU rules definitely have helped us to cast our net much wider when we're looking for specialty positions. Okay. Um, so that, that has been a real boon to us. But we have uh, somewhere between, in the neighborhood of 37, eight, nine different offices and agencies of the federal government. Okay. Um, so we have everything from we are the hub for our for our diplomatic couriers who, who ensure that the pouches get where they need to go. Um, so we have everybody from them. Uh, and what they've been doing recently, of course, is ensuring that freezers and vaccines are getting places. So, you know, like that, their work is the, of the most important. So we have everybody from them to law, the, the whole law enforcement community. We have a presence from the drug, the, Drug Enforcement Agency from the the um, IRS, uh, what is it? Internal Revenue Service. Uh, we have different aspects of Homeland Security. Um, so we have so many different uh, ways that we are here to uh, partner with the Germans, and then throughout uh, Europe, and then even into the Middle East and Africa and and Asia. So we have many many offices that are either regional or global platforms. We work, um, I would say with something in the neighborhood of 130 countries supporting them in some way or another from some office or another. Um, so, it, you know, it runs the gamut. And sometimes I think to myself, what in heaven's name does that office do here? You know, when I first met our, our former ambassador, Ambassador Grinnell, he came here and he said to me, Pat, what do all of those people who work for you do? And I said, well, I'm still finding out, sir, what, what, what they all do. But it's all really important work. So, you know, it is, it is a challenge. Uh, I would say one of the biggest challenges always is ensuring that, that there's open communication and coordination, you know, across the board because people are working on the same issues from a different angle. And if they don't communicate and know that you, you get into the stovepipe situation, which is not good for anyone. So it's, it's very challenging. And, and I always tell people one of our biggest challenges is that our boss sits in Berlin. Okay. And mm -hmm. so, you know, and we are one of five consulates. Of course, we're the biggest consulate here, but you know, there are four other consulates. And so, you know, we all have to coordinate with Berlin. And so that, that in itself is really a challenge, especially during COVID time when we don't go to Berlin and Berlin doesn't come here. So, um, you know, some unique, some unique challenges that we've had to address in the last year. Wow, in, in, incredibly complex uh, and very fascinating to understand. Um, one of my questions, which I had put down for discussion tonight, was about hierarchy, and I think that that fits fairly well into into <laughs> what you just mentioned. Um, the, the 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 boss in Berlin is obviously one thing, but then obviously within your organization, locally and within the the, the matrix yeah. of your different areas and so on, how important is hierarchy for you in your leadership role, and how would you how would you explain that? So anyone who's worked with state, the Department of State is the oldest cabinet agency. So starting with that, the first Secretary of State was Benjamin Franklin. Um, so we are very old and distinguished and people like to remind you of that. And part of what makes you old and distinguished usually is that you have a lot of hierarchical uh, restrictions. Um, 
so it's it can be challenging because you also have Washington in the mix. I think we've we've done a pretty good job here of really flattening that out. Um, part of that is it's it it all comes from the top. You know, um, the former ambassador was not about hierarchy. You know, he would always say to me, "Please call me Rick," and I said, "I'm sorry, Mr. Ambassador. I was raised to call you Mr. Ambassador, and there's no way I'm ever calling you Rick." <laughs> um, so I, you know, it some of it depends on style, but we're also in a country that the German governmental system is also very hierarchical, very. Um, so, you know, we work within that framework as well. So it, we, it behooves us to remember who we're guests of and how they work as well as how we work on our own. So that's an additional challenge. And that's where some of our really talented, amazing local staff comes in and helps keep us on the right track and say, you know, actually he didn't really mean that when he told you to call him Fred, <laughs> don't call him Fred. <laughs> okay. Have, have you ever seen, have you ever seen the leadership styles and the way that management addresses it? Yeah. Yes. And, and I completely understand where you're coming from because as I'm coming from Stockholm, everything is equal, flat and mm -hmm. very flat. And you, as a head of school, I would have a child telling me what they think is the right decision, and they would have equal weight as the CEO of a company who's going to tell me what he also thinks is correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's all the same. Um, they have a saying called Lagom. Uh, so it's not too much and not too little. And they put that into absolutely everything they do. Um, so I think it's important as you are moving around to other international posts to understand how hierarchy, how leadership is viewed in each country, because mm -hmm. then moving to Germany, I too have had to do a little bit of uh, rethinking about what I think about hierarchy mm -hmm. <laughs> and understanding mm -hmm. that it's okay, they're calling me Miss Raider and that makes them feel better and, and I'll appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. But it makes a difference to understand, just have that understanding and awareness and empathy of, okay, this is what they think is the correct order mm -hmm. and ways. And this uh, question goes to this person because they are my direct report and it's out yeah. of respect, yeah. Yeah. And it is a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge to balance that, you know, I mean, I had the advantage that pe some people remembered me and had worked with me two years ago. I mean, two years ago, I mean, my first tour, which was, you know, I left like 12 years ago. Um, but many people had never met me before. And, and, you know, no matter that you think you're just a regular person, you're still the CG, the director of the school, uh, you know, a high ranking person to so many people. And when you try to say, oh, just call me Pat, they're like, no, no. Yeah. You know, I told one of the, one of the security details that I have, I, I, you know, in the beginning, I said, please call me Pat. And one of them just looked up at me and said, ma'am, that is not happening. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So, I mean, then you have to figure out, yeah how you how you become yourself comfortable with that kind of a situation when that's not what you what you want or intended so yep. yeah yeah and um, like you had said we're out of respect we're in their country and mm -hmm. or whatever country you're in and, and yeah their way of help me to understand this is this is this is an interesting discussion for me i understood from from patricia that this is very top down this is directive Patricia, you would receive directions from Berlin, Washington, and then have to manage a style on communicating that to your staff. Corinna, you, you came from Stockholm. Obviously, the Swedish system is very flat. Uh, people call themselves by first name and so on. Is it, is it a cultural thing or is it within your organization? That means, it, are you living in an ISF world or are you living in Germany? I'm trying to understand. <laughs> You could probably answer that as well, Patricia. Um, I would say international schools in and of themselves are bubbles. Um, I, I graduated from an international school uh, in Santiago, Chile. And I remember 
my parents moving me to Chile, I was so excited to learn Spanish and to just engulf myself in the culture. And then you go to an international school and you're in this American bubble. This mm -hmm. was an American school down there. Um, and same thing when I was in Stockholm, the international school, it's very much an international bubble. You might have 50 to 60 different nationalities in this international school, but they're all, they've all been accustomed to moving from one international school to mm -hmm. another. It's a curriculum that is very similar from one international school to another. The expectations are very similar. Most of the kids only interact within themselves. So it's mode of English is the language. Um, so uh, I, I would say I am in an ISF bubble. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and, and are you, uh, similar to, to, to Patricia, are you a, a directive leadership style or is it, is it on a different leadership? What, what, how would you explain it, that? I, I would say it's still, it's still the type of leadership style that I was mentored as and by uh, another international leader that goes to Washington, uh, sorry, Western Beijing Academy, um, which is very inclusive and it's, uh, it's more of a collaborative style. So for instance, when I first started at ISF, since I didn't know anybody and I started the middle of the school year, Normally, as a school director, you would start at the beginning of the school year, you do a kickoff, you get to know everyone, you do an orientation week with the staff and then the students. I didn't have that. So uh, my first month, I spent the whole month having one-to-one -one meetings with every single staff member from the kitchen to the teachers to the IT, um, just to get to know everyone. And again, get to listen, hear their needs, uh, listen to their views, their opinions and ideas. Uh, and and I, I, I still definitely have that linear view of leadership. I, I, I think it's important that everyone has a choice and a voice. Uh, somebody has mm -hmm. to have the final say, but uh, I definitely think everyone needs to be heard. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, uh, just just one more question to to Corina. More about the, the the stakeholders. I can imagine that it's not only about you being the leader of teachers and uh, staff in your school, but you've also got obviously parents and you've got you've got pupils, uh, students in your school. Um, how how do how do these stakeholders work? How do you work with these different stakeholders? You try to make everyone happy in times of COVID. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> no, but you do your best. I, like I said, I definitely, my style is to listen and to ask a lot of really good questions. Um, I, I, I think it's really important that the parents have a say. And, and again, it comes down to, it's good to listen and it's good for them to feel like they're being heard. Um, in the end, there has to be a final decision and there has to be somebody that makes that final decision. But I don't think that a final decision can be made without proper uh, engagement and questioning. Thanks for that. Uh, Patricia, back to your hierarchy and directive style, which, which we've learned about. If, if you have an uncomfortable message or if you have an uncomfortable a situation to share with your staff. That means you simply receive, uh, and I don't want to say an order, but, but you receive some directive uh, which may be uh, difficult to explain to people around. How, how would that work for you? How do you normally approach that? Well, I, I mean, there are a lot of things that we do here that Berlin does not direct. I'm talking about like, I'm talking about like policy issues, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we do here is we have this enormous support platform, um, which Berlin does not have time to get involved in. Okay. Uh, so we have a, uh, quite a number of uh, leaders, you know, at the middle ranks and even at the higher ranks that, that have uh, people reporting up to them. Um, and then I have a deputy who is very senior. So we have a lot of different uh, uh, layers, uh, but we, it's a very big, busy place. So uh, for example, we have a director of the consular section. So people okay. who want to come and renew a passport, if they need a visa, um, 
that that is by and large all those rules are made in Washington how she runs it is you know we talk to her about that but okay. it's because she's so senior you know that she knows her job and she's done okay. much bigger jobs so we have that across the board very very competent senior leadership in the consulate from other agencies you know people who have been at the top of their agencies you know they they are highly respected and trusted by people in Washington so as far as that goes i think that the most critical part is always getting everybody going in the same direction yeah. you know because everybody has their little interest and their what they perceive as their uh, their overarching goal or you know, aim that they're trying to achieve. And so to make sure that those are all lashed up with the, the administration's priorities is really the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a lot of what we do is sort of filtering and interpreting and, you know, those kinds of things, not so much directing, I wouldn't say, mm -hmm. and then discussing and, you know, uh, when we have our senior staff meetings, really kind of letting people know, okay, this is what's going on. This is this is where Berlin is. This is where Washington mm -hmm. is. You know, how do we fit into this rubric? And and then what are we doing? So, um, you know, we have our overarching objectives, and we have to figure out, okay, where do we fit in those? You know, what we do is really critical. How do we let people know that? Make sure we have enough resources. You know, so there, it's always. Uh, busy and up and down, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a bit hard to describe because so much mm -hmm. is going on all the time in so many different spaces. Yeah, no, but I, I think we're getting, we're getting an idea of what is going on and thank you for sharing so yeah. many insights tonight. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, Corinna, you, you talked about communication being so important and I think that that is valid for both, for both of you ladies. Um, what are the feedback tools which you work with so that, that your staff, uh, people around you who you work with can give you feedback? What, what are the channels which, which you use for feedback? Yeah, I, I actually was going to ask Patricia about this and how it is now with communicating in COVID. Because before it was, of course, you could have a nice large staff meeting or you could have a director's breakfast where you'd bring in parents from each grade level. We've got the KG parents for kindergarten and preschool and the primary parents, the middle school and the high school parents. Each set of parents and students have their different needs and questions and you could bring them on campus and you could have nice big open forums. And unfortunately now that is not as available. So we're using Teams, which is okay. essentially the Zoom of our school. Um, and I'm still doing breakfast with the directors, with the different schools and parents, um, but it's not the same. It's really, it's really challenging. That's one thing that has been uh, a bit of a struggle for me is that mm -hmm. sense of community and ISF family. Usually an international school is very tight and the parents, uh, they have their own groups that they okay. come together on campus and they meet and they have coffee and we haven't been able to have parents come on campus and um, now the students aren't even on campus, they're online. So trying to reach out to them and drop in and make sure they're mm -hmm. doing okay is, is quite difficult. We're doing our best uh, virtually, but virtually doesn't solve all of the, all of the problems. Um, another thing I do is I do a lot of surveys with the parents. Okay. For instance, I just did a survey because I'm trying to help uh, create an improvement plan for next year with our senior leadership team. And so just three simple questions. What are we doing really well? What do we keep doing? What do we need to stop doing? What aren't we doing mm -hmm. so well? And what should we start doing? What haven't we thought of that other schools might be doing that they saw at a different school? Um, and so just keep, stop, start and helping to set up some goals for the following year. Perfect. I, yeah. I get carried away with that. I spent half of my life with a big uh, corporate company, American company, and my, my role was to do those surveys. And I spent uh, a lot of time of my life doing <laughs> surveys on recommend to a friend and, and so on and so on. I, 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 I appreciate it a lot because it, it helps you to really understand big groups and so on. Mm -hmm. It depends how, how much you embed it into your organization and how important it is for you your personal goals and your organization. Mm -hmm. So good. I, I think it's a nice mix.
Felix, uh, pa Patricia, to you, what are the tools which you are using currently? So um, when we when we had to had to go into home office, um, I used to have a daily stand up with my senior team. Okay. So you know, and it was it was a great time for everyone getting to know each other, bonding, you know, uh, remembering. Oh, hey, I forgot to tell you we're doing this. You'd probably be interested in that. Um, so we right away went to having that uh, on a phone call. Um, a lot of people didn't want to be on video, you know, in their pajamas or whatever. So I said, that's fine. We can, you know, if you want to be on video, nobody wanted to be on video. Okay, fine. Um, so we have a phone call. So what we did with COVID was we made the Monday one into a task force to talk mostly about COVID issues, right? And, and initially we had that every morning because it was just so critical. Then we came to a point where I said, okay, I asked people, okay, how comfortable are you feeling with this? You know, do, do we need to do this every day? And they said, no, 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 we can't, you know. So Mondays, we still have the task force. Tuesdays, we have senior staff. So that's expanded. So that's like all my senior leadership team, which, you know, in the consulate is like 50 people. You know, it's huge, 60 people. Um, so, and that's where I'm able to tell them, okay, you know, here are the priorities, here's what's happening, here are the new rule, you know, whatever it is I, I have to tell them. And, and initially we only had that every other week before COVID, but during COVID we're, we've been having it every week and they want to keep that. Um, there was a time when things were pretty good and we have a huge conference room. And so we, I allowed people to come in wearing masks. Um, so that we could see each other because people just felt so isolated. And we had people who had transferred in and hadn't come to work. They'd just been working from home. So I, I realized how hard it was for people to build their small teams and for, for me to build the big team. So we did that for a while uh, in the summer when we could so that people would be able to have, you know, that connection, which, you know, it's, it's just, it's, you, you just can't, you can't measure the value of that. Um, and so that was one of the big things. But what we tried to do also was trying to continue with things that we did. You know, we have a big awards ceremony twice a year. Um, and it was always famous for uh, having people come, not just to get their awards, but we would intersperse between the awards was entertainment. You get to see some of your colleagues who are really talented and you don't know about it. You know, once my deputy invited a, you know, invited an, an Elvis impersonator to serenade me, at, you know, by surprise, you know, things like that. So I said, we're going to continue to do this and we're going to figure out ways we can entertain people remotely. So this year I got a new deputy and he's so funny and talented. And so he did a um, Home Alone spoof and we all participated and we, and we videoed it. And it, you know, so it was really a lot of fun. So we've tried to do things like that to keep people you know, really um, engaged. But I can, I can feel that you know, people have kind of hit the wall and so it's difficult. I, I sent out a weekly message for a, a while and then I know people were getting tired of it. So then I didn't send one for a while. My boss in Berlin always sent one, uh, you know, so various things like that to try and keep people, um, you know, really engaged. And then sometimes I would just call people randomly and say, how are you doing? I was thinking of you, how's it going? Or if somebody wrote a good, a good uh, analysis of something, I would call them and say, hey, that was a really good analysis that you wrote, you know, things like that. Um, I would wander around the consulate in my mask and say, see who's there, you know, bring cookies from my, from my cook, uh, you know, yeah, it's just, just anything to try and keep people connected and, and feeling like they're part of the community. Perfect. And, and uh, we'll take you by the word and probably for one of our next sessions, invite your deputy to manage one of one, one of those sessions or invite the, the Elvis <laughs> imitator. Well, this sounds some, like some, some really good plans. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks to both of you for sharing the insights. I think we're, we're understanding a little bit better about your organizations. We're trying yeah. to understand how you lead those organizations. Uh, I would like to move to a second part of our of our session tonight, and that is uh, talking about women in leadership. We mm -hmm. promised that in the title. I know that many of our audience uh, joined because that is an interesting and and always interesting and challenging uh, subject. Um, uh, I, I saw when I when I did my research, Pat, Patricia, that that.
that uh, some German newspapers wrote about your very colorful dresses and some, you've got some flower styles or something. So the only thing I Googled and found out when I looked up was first <laughs> thing was about your, your, st your, your dressing style and that you wear very colorful dresses and so on. How, how, how do you react to something like that as, as, a, as a leader in a role which, which has got a position uh, when people start discussing things which are a little bit aside of what you would normally concentrate on and what, what would your normal role be? I, I completely ignore them, I have to say. <laughs> I, I just, I completely ignore them. Um, I do feel that one of the most important things about leadership, it doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man, it doesn't matter. You have to know who you are and what you're comfortable with and you have to be true to yourself. Because when you're not yourself, people really know that you're not. And, and I, so I just, that's who I am. So, you know, I wear what I want. I, I pretty much say what I want. Although, you know, Thomas will tell you sometimes they're like, oh, I can't believe she just said that. Um, and, you know, that's, I think it's important for people to feel that you're comfortable with yourself and that this is who you really are and that you, you are, being honest with them about not just who you are, but what you're saying, you know, like what you believe. I spend a lot of time in schools with especially, you know, seniors, high school kids, universities. They, they will tell you right away when you're full of, of baloney. And so you, if you wanna be credible, you have to really figure out who you are and what you're comfortable with and what you believe. And then, and then you have to go from there. So I think that if you don't do that, you're going to struggle a lot more um, in, in, in this situation. But advice to people other than that, you know, you have to, you have to kind of, uh, it's something you have to practice at, right? Be, you know, people say, oh yeah, he's a born leader. No, he's not. No, mm -hmm. she's not. You know, you, you have to figure it out. You make mistakes. Sometimes you have to apologize to people and say, oh, I made such a bad decision and I'm so sorry. I should have followed what, what you thought was better or, you know, whatever the situation is. Um, and I think the more, comfortable, the more comfortable you feel with yourself, then you feel comfortable also, you know, being a bit humble when you make a bad decision or, you know, you don't support someone maybe that, in the way you could have in, in something they were doing. Yeah. Thanks. I, I think it, 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 it comes to being authentical to being yourself, if I understand mm -hmm. that right. And that, that yeah. would be a strong leadership skill uh, yeah. Fr yeah. from your perspective. Is that, is yeah. that correct? Excellent. Yes. Uh, Corina, have you been um, uh, facing these, these typical stereotype discussions in your career? Have you, have you had, had those situations? When I first started in middle leadership, when I was in, uh, in schools, I didn't see it as much because you were working a lot, of course, in education, you do see a lot of female uh, women working alongside of you. When you get into middle leadership, again, you're still working with quite a few colleagues that are, uh, that are women. It's once you get into uh, senior leadership, the director level, you don't see as many women in leadership. I think they just did a survey with international schools around the globe and 20 to 30% of the directors or heads of schools are women. So it, it definitely narrows out. I noticed a difference when I first went into being head of schools in Stockholm. You, at first, I felt like I had to act like one of the good old boys. Um, and, and that's fine. I, I, I love hanging out with guys. I've always loved, I was on a swim team. My best friends were always men and women. It didn't matter. I, I really didn't see uh, gender or <laughs> anything else. Um, but then as you, as you kind of get into your own skin, like you had said, Patricia, you start to um, get a little more experience and you start to find and hone your leadership style. And I think that's what I had to discover instead of copying what everyone else around me was doing with all the other directors that I saw, 
um, doing. I found my own leadership style. And for me, that's absolute honesty and humility. And, and like you had said, when, when you make a mistake, you own up to it. And um, I, I'm sure I've heard someone famous say this, but if you're going to fail, fail fast and fail <laughs> forward and pick yourself up and get going, learn from your mistakes and, and move on. Um, I've been quite candid with my staff here at mm -hmm. ISF, especially with the COVID crisis. You're trying a whole bunch of new things mm -hmm. that have never been tried before. Um, I, I wrote a very honest and open letter to the staff about two months in. And I just said, look, guys, I'm sorry. This isn't what I signed up for. Um, we're going to try a few different ways to open the school or reopen the school. Mm -hmm. I need you with me. We need to stay positive. Uh, and if it doesn't work, you need to tell me because I can't fix what I don't know is broken. Mm -hmm. I can't fix what I don't know is not working well. Um, so I think the more open and honest I am with staff, the more open and I, staff and parents and students, the more mm -hmm. they feel they can come to me and really let down their guards and, and tell me how they feel. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, like I said, you can't fix what you don't know is is broken. Excellent. No, I'm 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 learning a lot, taking notes already. I think there are some very very key uh, characteristics which you've already mentioned right now. Um, in in my first approach when we when we started about the discussion about women in leadership positions, I had something like, "What is a typical women leadership style?" or something. But more general. Can we understand for, for, for independent of, of, of gender, uh, what are styles and what is, what, is a, what is a characteristic of a good leader in, in, from, your, from your perspective? Your perspective, perspective. That so, I, so I think there are so many characteristics for a good leader. Uh, you know, I, I have worked with many good leaders, some great leaders. Um, and they're all different. They're all different. Uh, one of the things that, one of the threads that run through that, through it though, is that, you know, they take responsibility for their decisions. They get, they get input from their team. Um, you know, they, they work, they work to empower their team. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy, it's a crazy leader who wants to be a micromanager, you know. Um, so there, those are just some of the characteristics. Now, I tend to be much more less directive and more collaborative. I love to hear other people's mm -hmm. ideas. You know, they come to me with an idea and I say, hey, sure, run with it. That sounds great. Go for it. Let's see what happens. Um, and, and I, I like to have input from people, you know, hey, this might sound like a crazy idea, but this occurred to me that we could make this work and, and things could be better with, if we did this. What do you think? Um, you, can't, you can't have too much ego because then honest input is, uh, honest feedback doesn't go very far. So, you know, I think there, I think it was it from Harvard, someone wrote a really, interesting article a few years back about one of the greatest the greatest characteristics of a, of a great leader is one we see very seldom which is humility so and, and um, i heard the word from corina before so i think that th th there seems to be a common agreement that, that yeah. those are some really important yeah. characteristics yeah. Uh, again i've been taking notes i've been taking keywords incredible incredible things i've heard Corinna, anything to add? I think P P Patricia said a lot, but anything, anything which comes to your mind? I would agree with Patricia. And, and the thing that the, the quote that comes out is the Steve Jobs quote about it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. We uh, hire smart right. people, so they tell us what to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Which is true. If you hire well, then it makes your life so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right. Get, getting um, the right team together, yeah. Exactly, exactly, and teamwork uh, definitely is important. And I would say also IQ. Everyone now has the IQ of a thousand because you've got Google in your hand. So EQ, I think, is yeah. so much more important. The emotional intelligence, uh, emotional 
uh, awareness, knowing how to have a good relationship, relationship management and social awareness and self-awareness how to control yourself when you're upset <laughs> and make it look like you're still smiling on the outside when you're burning on the inside um, and, and just also self-management. I think those are really important things. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, and again, so, some, some amazing um, 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 definitions and, and clear understanding of leadership from my perspective. Thank you for sharing. Um, Last one on this on this middle part on on women empowerment, uh, female leadership. leadership. What are the challenges? That means obviously there may be. I'm. I don't want to run into stereotypes, but if there are, it would be interested to hear what what they are if they are. Wow. There there are many challenges. Um, for example. In all the time we've had a consulate in Frankfurt, I'm only the third woman who's had this job. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, I look at the wall of photos, it's just middle aged white guy, middle aged white guy, middle aged yeah. white guy, you know, by the dozen. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, part of it is, is that tradition and that expectation of what my role is, and because I'm female and what, what the opposite gender's role is. Um, and I don't mind setting that on his head and just saying, I refuse to play that role in a nice way, you know. Um, I have worked in a really all male field, which was IT, and I was a senior, I was a senior leader and a colleague who was a friend. And my our kids went to school together and he had the office next door to mine, said in a in an open meeting with all the senior people, well, Pat has to plan the Christmas party because she's the only girl. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I, I was speechless. It's hard to make me speechless, but for like a few beats, I was like, I can't believe I just heard that. But then I said to him, I can't believe you just said that to me anywhere, but in front of all the, you know, and he was not phased at all. He just could not see what he had done wrong. You know, so there's still a lot of those some people are better at hiding those kinds of attitudes, but many people still have them. Um, so being aware of that and just not putting up with it, I think is, it's really important. But sometimes that's very difficult or you're more junior than the person who is, who has that kind of attitude. So, you know, enlisting, enlisting allies, you know, that's our, that's our new, buzzword, of course, in the State Department is, you know, allies, um, but also um, enlisting mentors. You know, I tell, I tell uh, young women all the time, I'm really happy to mentor you. I know that you want a woman, but think about asking a senior man to mentor you. Then they have a stake in your success. And, and you know, you can, then you're going to have a different relationship with them if they're your mentor. And then you may be able to discuss with them, you know, why, why do men talk to me this way? Or, you know, why do I get mansplained all the time? Uh, so that's, that's interesting. That, that, it, it, just to deep dive for, us for a moment. That means the idea of having a, a, a male mentor for a, a, a woman, a female career, is, 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 that, is that what you're saying would, would be understanding the different views of what, 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 is, the, what, is, the male, what is the what is the biggest advantage of that? Uh, well, I think the biggest advantage is women are women are kidding themselves if we think that we are going to make huge changes and strides forward without men helping us. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I I, I, let I that did it. I, uh, <laughs> I did it. I did a, a a wonderful event. You know, a year and a half ago, Frau and Mit format. You know, we Mackenzie let us use a wonderful space. It was fantastic. I I expected you know like thirty people, and we had we had to turn people, there were like 120 women who showed up. And unbeknownst to me, they had said, this is only for women. So this one of the senior partners in the firm who welcomed me, what happened to be a man. And I said, oh, I hope you're gonna come to my presentation. He said, I'm not allowed. I was told it was for women only. I said, you are allowed and you're gonna sit in the front row. And he did. And I made that point to the women. I said, we can't shut out men, yeah. we can't. Because then it, we, we don't want this to be 
We want it to be collaborative. We want men to understand that we're all better off when women have the same opportunities. We're all better off when we have diversity and inclusion. We're, it's, that's a fact and that's what, how we have to get people to see that. So if, you're, if they're included in the discussion and feel they have a stake in the success, it's gonna work better. Thanks again for sharing incredible insights. Corina, to you. Yeah, uh, to piggyback on that, I think it comes, it needs to come from the government. It needs to come from individual corporations where it's your policies, it's your paternity leave, it's your maternity leave, it's your childcare policies. Um, all of that needs to come as the foundation and also seeing men and women sit on these leadership boards and uh, as the president or in uh, vice council, you need to see multicolor, multi-gender, um, multi-sexual preference, whatever it might be, you need to see the diversity uh, mm -hmm. from, the, from the foundation. It, to give an example of, of challenges that I've had, um, I told you I have three children and I had the luxury of having three children in three different locations around, around the world. And my first, I had just started uh, what I thought was my dream job. And I hadn't been there a year. It was in Seattle, Washington. And it, I don't know if you know in the United States to qualify for insurance and benefits and all that fun stuff, you need to be employed for a full year. So I fell pregnant. And it was, I think, a month before I had the year anniversary that I gave birth. And my choice was to either take two weeks off, and this was a luxury, they were giving me two weeks off of unpaid leave that I could go have my child and come right back to work after two weeks, or I had to resign. So I had to resign, and I felt like I had gotten up the ladder and then boom, 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 knocked down a bit. Um, and then I you know, finally moved to Sweden where they have childcare provided. And so I put my littlest one into childcare. I started back to work, starting up the ladder again, um, got to uh, vice principal level, fell pregnant again. And luckily in Sweden, they have 18 months of maternity, paternity leave. And they mandate that the husband or the, the partner has to take a portion of that. So I got to share my paternity leave with my husband and I got to go back to work. So I didn't fall down the ladder too much, but then we were transferred again back to the United States to Washington DC, started working again. Uh, also <laughs> had my third child and went back down the ladder. So I felt like it was this up and down, up and down. You take two steps, three steps back. Um, and, and that's to no fault, but of the system, to be honest, I think it, like going back to what I was saying before, it's either the corporations in the US have to really stand by each other and support every single gender that they employ or um, a government like uh, Sweden. And I think Germany has a very similar child care um, benefits and social package. I think those kind of things will help the women not fall down that ladder so much. Thanks to both of you. I think great different aspects. Uh, Patricia, from the, personal st from the personal style, Corinna, very much to the government and organizational support uh, lacking in, in some of the cases. Uh, some, some really good views. Thanks for that. Um, I, I, I'm also inviting everybody uh, to, to think of questions if you want to deep dive onto any of the things we talked about. Let's do another five minutes, if that's okay, on, on our last subject and then open up for questions. The, the, the last one is, is um, leadership in innovation. And, and the idea was to talk about, and I think co Corona situation fits very well, where, where, where change is happening in your organizations. And for me, one, the one side is to cope with change. You've already mentioned some of the things which you had to do in order to cope with the changes, where you had to change your leadership styles, where you had to change your styles of, of, of communication. But the other one is, 
what innovation comes out of change and what innovation comes out of your leadership role. So if we can spend a couple of minutes on thinking about some, some of the things which, which you would see as an innovation coming out of Corona situation right now, but also out of your, your personal leadership style. That means where do you encourage, uh, where do you encourage and ask for innovation? Where do you support that? Perhaps some examples if you have, and again, a couple of minutes if that is fine. Well, Corona definitely has changed how we work. We did not allow telework overseas. Okay. For, you know, so only only situational, only in emergencies. So that within a week, we had to get everyone up and teleworking, and uh, that was such a challenge. Um, and we really, our our IT staff really had to liaise closely with Washington, continue putting more applications, you know, in a remote uh, format so that we could, people could work from home safely, um, and, but yet get their work done. Uh, so that I was, I was really pleasantly surprised at how, how well that went. Uh, yeah, you always have a few, a few you know, hiccups, but it, it went very, very well. Um, I'm not sure what innovations are gonna come out of that for us. You know, we are a staid old organization and I hope that we're going to try and continue to allow people to be more flexible. I think that is really, really important. It, it really helps you keep people, keep their morale high, people who commute a long ways if they don't have to do it every day but I don't know where Washington will come down on that. I feel the genie's out of the bottle and maybe the bottle's even broken. So I, I, I feel like in some form, we're gonna have to be able to continue to do that, but I don't know what that's gonna look like. You know, as far as other uh, innovations, we have really had to use technology here because, you know, this is a regional hub and people, that's what yeah. they do is travel. They go in, you know, they do inspections, they, they go and help. Our, our training team has gone 100% remote, you know, flipping courses to all online. And that has been a real challenge for people, first of all, because they like to travel, you know, that's a big part of what they've done. Um, but people have really gotten to the spirit of it and it's going quite well. And I foresee that that will stay. You know, we don't need to ship everybody to Frankfurt physically when they can tune in. And, you know, maybe there are a few seminars, things that you might want to do in person, but you certainly can train many, many people in a remote format. And so I feel like we're, we're also going to be able to up our game as far as the number of people we train and the number of courses we can offer in a year, uh, you know, all kinds of things like that. So I feel like that is really a good outcome. Um, yeah. You know, it's and, and it, yeah, 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 yeah. The other thing that we are looking at, um, and I've been looking at it strategically for the last year, two years now, is looking at the presence in Frankfurt and you know who is here, do they all need to be here, and re-looking at that given home office, the ability to work remotely. Um, so that that the outcome of that is still unclear, but we've been able to eliminate several positions and thus save money you know, that we, we've just discovered we didn't need anymore. So that, that's been a big one as well. Okay, good. So some things coming out, obviously. Perfect. Uh, Corinna, from, from a school, I mean, the, the German schools, you, you're probably following what's going on in, in German okay. public schools, yeah. moving from uh, uh, part, uh, uh, splitting classes into half, uh, struggling with technology and so on. Um, I've been watching ISF. Uh, I had the chance to see the campus uh, do an open house when you, when you were, I think, the, th the third day in or something. That that, that was an amazing yeah. experience to see how technology and everything is. What are the innovations coming out for, for, for you from a school perspective? I mean, yeah, I mean, luckily, Sabas uh, is we're part of the Sabas network, and they're very digitally minded. They were before COVID. Um, it's almost like they were preparing for COVID. I hate to say that, but they uh, have all of the lessons already prepared and paced for the teachers and they put them on these inter interactive whiteboard slides. 
Um, so they're like PowerPoints, but they're a little more interactive. Um, and so we were able to take those and implement them onto our team's platform. So that was something that I had to scramble and learn uh, German GDP laws and data protection laws quite quickly. But within a couple of months, we had all the students with Teams accounts and all the staff with Teams accounts. And we collapsed the day and did a professional development training day on, okay, these are the bare necessity non-negotiables that everyone has to be doing to teach via Teams online. So the staff had their little rubric of, okay, I need to make sure that I'm still following these procedures to be able to teach to the students online. And it, it was amazing. I mean, our, our staff, it was so, um, it, it was inspiring to see how quickly they were able to adapt from the on-campus teaching to the online setting. The students, of course, they loved it because they could sit in their pajamas and in their bed and have their breakfast while they're having their homeroom and first period of class. Uh, so uh, things that we want to keep, I think we'll probably have to keep the online learning for a little bit. There's still talks about, you know, every year you might still have this wave where it peaks, uh, virus peaks, and we need to close schools or even snow days. We can still use the online learning if it's too dangerous to drive into school or if the trains aren't working. Um, it also, we've got so many international students that they want to spend an extra week in their home country after Christmas break. So then they could continue the online classes, having them streamed uh, as the teacher is teaching the students in the classroom, they can have the class streamed to them at home. So things like that, we, uh, I think we're definitely taking advantage of, of the different uh, uh, crisis, uh, you know, the innovations that come with the crisis. Uh, I think the parents are really appreciating our parent teacher mm -hmm. conferences that we have online because they can still attend while they're at the office, the breakfast with the directors, they don't have to travel all the way in or take the day off for work, they can pop in have a cup of coffee and ask me any questions they might have on a Friday morning so yeah fashion party that we just had today and we streamed live to the parents at home. <laughs> even with an atmosphere then. Good, I, I, I can hear some innovation coming coming out of that. Corinna, obviously you started at a very, very good point already. That means uh, this, the school already was very well equipped with, with technology and so on, but it looks like there's been some major uh, developments out of the last months and out of the period right now, right? Yeah, yes. Excellent. Um, it, to, to our audience, I, I would really like to invite you to ask questions. We did discuss three major fields today. Um, I, I've been following a little bit in the chat. I'm not, not sure whether I missed any questions so far. We did talk just for your, just as a reminder, we did talk about both of the big organizations which uh, Corinna and Pat are leading. We understood more about how they are organized, how, how big they are, the, the, the form of the organization. We did talk about leadership styles. I personally took many notes, took some really, really good keynote, key, key words, which I think are really inspiring between uh, authenticity, honesty, feedback, uh, ca candid and openness, uh, empower people to, to make decisions, uh, to talking about emotional leadership. So I think many, many inspirations there, but perhaps many questions as well. We did talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges uh, women in leadership positions may, may face. And we, we had the chance to speak about innovation right now. So if you if you have any questions about the, the fields we have or anything else on your mind, please feel free to please just raise your hand. We've got around still 60 people in the room just to manage this a little bit. And Thomas, help me if there's anything unclear or if anybody is waving and I can't see that. Uh, we have one hand up, Matilda Wunderlich. Now, Matilda, would you like? Perfect. Why, why don't you just start off then? Yeah. Matilda. Matilda? Uh, she did ask a question in the, in the chat function. Maybe I'll read it out loud if she's having technical Excellent, difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for those interesting insights. Would you say that there's a clear difference between female leaders in Germany and America in terms of acceptance by society? 
Um, that was excellent question. Yeah. That, that is a really good question. Um, well, I mean, this is a country that's had a female chancellor for how long? 12 years, 16 years? Oh, forever. Right? Forever. <laughs> so, I mean, that's sort of the epitome of female leadership. Um, well, now we've got a female vice president. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't think I know enough about uh, leader, female leadership in Germany to really be able to, to address that. I think it much depends on the industry you work in, uh, you know, your history. There, there are just so many factors about whether you accept uh, female leadership versus male leadership that, that I, I don't think I'm really qualified to, to comment on that. Corinna, anything from your perspective? I, I would probably say the same. The, the difference I saw and, and I witnessed in my own family is the support on the back end. So okay. uh, in, in the US, my husband was raised um, in the US and it was very much mom was a stay at home mom and dad was the one that worked. Same in my family, dad was the one that worked, mom was the stay at home. So that was just something that when we first met and we got married, it, we just fell into our gender roles. Um, then we moved to Sweden and there are no gender roles. You will see more men at the playgrounds than you will females and <laughs> women. You will see more men pushing the prams or the buggies than you will the, the females. Uh, and so my husband, I got him to quickly adapt to the new way in Sweden. <laughs> And, and I can say that support was, it was like weights lifted off of my shoulders and I felt like I could really rise uh, because he had helped. So I, I think yeah. that was where I found the difference. Yeah. So, so Mat Mat Matilda, it looks like that, that both Germany and uh, the US can learn from Sweden still. So perhaps yeah. back to your question. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the challenges for women here that I see and the women that I talk to is that there's still much here that's very traditional about the expectation once mm -hmm. women have children about what they will do. And any society that sends kids home to eat lunch at home expects that the mom is gonna be there. And so as long as that's the case here, I feel like women are really mm -hmm. set back um, mm -hmm. And I know I've, in talking to many women, they say how hard it is to come back into the job market if you took time off. Yeah, it's great. You get time off, you're paid and everything, but you really pay for that professionally when you try to re-enter the job market unless you have, you know, some special help or something like that. So I think there are certain mm -hmm. challenges here that, that um, I didn't face. When, when I had a child, I, yeah, I didn't get a lot of maternity leave, but you know, I, my daughter went to all day school and you know, so I think there, there are always things that, that we don't look at and we, can, we mm -hmm. could as a society say, you know, how could we better support not just women, you know, but parents, you know, writ large, families, um, the whole family, yeah. Good, good, good observation. Thank you for, for sharing. Uh, I'm probably blind for that, but it's so obvious and so clear. Corinna, I'm sure you, uh, ISF provides lunch, right? I, I've seen the canteen. We actually, the, our enrollment has picked up in the KG and the preschool by German parents because we offer from 8.20 yeah. to 6 o'clock, yeah. we have school for the kids and, and mm -hmm. snacks and lunch and mm -hmm. um, a, a nice warm place for them to play. Yeah. What, what, a, what, a what a difference a lunch makes here. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, good, good observation, honestly, yeah. Um, uh, Thomas, I can see Sandrine asking yeah. a question in the we chat. Have, I think and, there's and that, two questions that are related yeah. to each other, role models. I'll use the word role models as, a, um, as they say in German, the Stichwort, uh, the buzzword. Uh, do you see yourselves as role models uh, for young females? Is one side of the coin, and on the other side of the coin, 
do you have a particular role model that you look up to? And that, that question is addressed to both you, uh, Corinna, and, and uh, Pat. I'm gonna let Corinna go first. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would love to think that I'm a role model to the students and the staff. Uh, and it, it, for me, it's more important that I'm making sure that I present myself as a role model, even though I might not be. I need to model the behavior that I wanna see in my staff and my students. And, and that's just making sure that I treat everyone with, with respect and have, again, humility and humor. I think humor goes a long way. Um, I would say my role models, I've had a mentor that uh, has, has been my mentor since I was at Stockholm International School. And she's been deeply impactful whenever I'm having a hard time or if I'm interviewing or just going through these COVID uh, different situations of how to operate a school and ideas and bouncing ideas off of someone else. It's been great to have a, a, another role model to go to. And then one that I look up to and would aspire to be is Melinda Gates. I think she's definitely a, a wonderful role model for women and empowerment and everything that she does for uh, the globe. I think those are, those are my top role models. That's, that's nice. So um, I had very recently in November, the experience of where my mother passed away and my sisters and I were writing her obituary. And it was amazing to think in the 80, almost 90 years she lived, how many young women's lives she touched. My mom was a Girl Scout leader for 45 years. And in our community, in the same small community, you know, taught taught uh, catechism classes, but she also was the first woman to run for and be elected to our local school board. Um, so, you know, and my mother was a very, my parents had a very traditional marriage um, and my mother was kind of quiet, but in her own way, so unyielding and so not caring about what society thought about her. And, and it was so wonderful to see all these now grown women whose lives she had touched in some way, you know, sending notes and saying, wow, your mom was always so amazing. And she, she exposed us to this and she, you know, taught us about that. And she was always so supportive of our dreams. So that was, you know, I thought to myself, wow, I hope when I die that there are at least a few young women who say, yeah, she was okay, you know, she helped us, you know, understand this or mentored us or, so um, I would aspire to be like that, but I, you know, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard sometimes to think that you're that old, that you're, <laughs> that you're the role model, yeah. So. I've, I've got to chime in. I don't know how I could forget my mom. <laughs> yeah, my mom by far is my role model. Yeah. She, she I, stood strong every time my dad brought her to Timbuktu and back and moved yeah. the entire family every two years. She, she was the pillar of strength. So I don't yeah. know how I could forget her. <laughs> yeah, but I think it, it just shows you too that there are so many ways that you can touch people's lives. And, and often, you know, like, you ask somebody who changed their life, 90% of the time people will tell you it was a teacher. And I'll tell you, um, you know, my daughter, like I told you, she went to ISF for two years. And so today I met our new intern at, at the consulate and we were chatting and her English was amazing. So I said, where did you go to school? She said, ISF for many years. And so she was a couple of years younger than my daughter. So they didn't know each other, but I asked her, I said, oh, did you have this math teacher? And she was like, she was so amazing. And I said, my daughter still talks about her all those years later, you know, that she had her in fourth grade. So, you know, now she's 24. So, you know, I think that is also something that people really underestimate how much a caring, teacher can have an impact on on someone's life because that you know that's a time when you're super impressionable and very vulnerable as you know as a kid 
Yeah. I, I, to, I'll, I'll follow up on that because I think yeah. that what we're finding right now with COVID and everybody being online, the teachers yeah. and students don't have that one-to-one -one connection. You're finding that school is so much more than just a place of educating. It's a social place. It's a place of uh, having somebody tell them that they're valued and they're important yeah. and they can, they can be anybody they want to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yep. I want, I'm, I'm so looking forward to have our students back because I know <laughs> they need know. to be back in person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thomas, I think we've got more questions in the chat. I can see at yep. least one. Correct. Indeed, we do. Um, from Rebecca Bodemer, uh, or Bodemer. If a uh, question, uh, how did your leadership style change when, uh, when moving to Germany, if it did? Um, I think, Corinna, you already started on that subject. You came from Sweden. Uh, we talked right. about a very liberal, very open, very flat hierarchy. Uh, how, how, much, how much of a change did you have to start? How, how big was that change when you came into Frankfurt? I, I can tell you the biggest change is that people listened to me when I asked them to do something. <laughs> they didn't ask so many <laughs> questions. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> It was great. Uh, I, I, I kind of missed the dialogue and the open questions that I had in Sweden, but here I asked somebody to do something and they went right about doing it. And I, I now am, I'm encouraging people to push back. Don't just say yes. If you don't feel yes is the right answer, then tell me, please come to me with a solution and tell me what you think the right answer is. Mm -hmm. So, and Thanks. Uh, Pat, I mean, you've, you've worked in so many different locations yeah. around the world. And if I get Rebecca's question right, it is also about adapting to the local uh, yeah. policies, local habits, local traditions, and so on. Yeah. What did you feel when you came to Frankfurt? What, what, what was different for you? So one of the, one of the real challenges uh, when, you, when you get a job like this one is that so many people work for you that you... If you're the kind of person like I am who always knows everybody's name, usually knows about their family, like what they're in, you know, like I chat with people, that's impossible to do when you have that many employees and they turn over routinely. Um, so recognizing that and trying to figure out a way to connect with people was a challenge for me. That was really a challenge for me. Um, so luckily I have a couple of people on staff who've been around and said, well, you know, we could do this, we could do that. So, um, you know, and I realized that many of, the, of my local employees had never been to my residence. You know, they had worked at the consulate. Someone told me he'd worked at the consulate for 30 years and he had never been to the CG's house. So um, I switched and we had the staff Christmas party in my backyard and, you know, um, but trying to connect with people, I think, you know, on a personal level was much more challenging than anywhere else I've ever worked just due to the size and, you know, the position that I have. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so. Good point. So I think that, that that was a change which was majorly driven by the size of the organization. That means mm -hmm. you move from a smaller place to a rather big one yeah. here. So suddenly having so many people in staff, you could just, just, I want to deep dive on that, on that German thing. That means anything yeah. which comes to your mind and don't, don't worry about stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, I am German. We've got many Germans here. We can stand it probably. What, 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 what were observations you had in the style of leadership in, in Germany? What was different? Or probably you have a, a lot of people in your, in your team who are Germans as well. So yeah. Yeah. Any, any observations to that? Um, I would say, uh, very competent. People are very competent. Um, like one of the things I think that, that sometimes when you're trying to be innovative, they are comfortable in their groove. And mm -hmm. when you're like, but I want you to go this way. They're like, no, no, I'm comfortable going this way. So I think that that's one of the things that I have railed about the most, you know, I've said, <sighs> You know, why won't Franz change how he does X or Y, you know, um, well, because that's how Franz likes to do it. Uh, but, but I think that 
that can be true of many cultures and people. But but you, I, I have seen that a, a bit here, you know, and then kind of a reluctance to like really fight the fight and say, you know, we really need to change how we're doing this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Corina, any observations from your side? Um, I, I too noticed that, but I wasn't sure if it was because of the longevity at the school and they were just really fixed on their mindset and uh, it hadn't quite incorporated the growth mindset yet. Mm -hmm. But I, I, do, I do notice that um, we've got uh, quite a large staff of, of Germans and they, they do like their things and their ways in a particular um, schedule and a particular setting in a particular place. Um, and I was worried about them going online and teaching online because that's such a disruption to your schedule and to what you are used to doing. And they, they were able to pick up their particularities and put them right back into place at home. So I'm hoping <laughs> we can, can bring it back onto campus when we move back to campus. <laughs> that's great. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> again, th thanks. I can I can really imagine. And again, uh, managing change and and driving change and innovation is is a challenge. I I am sure it's it's a, it's a German challenge, but uh, you you probably get it in many countries in the world. But mm -hmm. yes, uh, I can imagine that this is one of the biggest ones. Uh, yeah. Thomas, any any more questions from the chat? I, from what I see, I don't see any relevant questions. Yeah. Um, what do you consider relevant, Thomas? <laughs> no, David, I, I'm absolutely fine. I, we, we, I've we've placed my it. question twice, yeah. Thomas. No, no, absolutely fine. No, uh, uh, David, we've seen it absolutely. It, it the, the, the I, and I, I'd, I'd love to talk about startups and the ideas of uh, global opportunities and so on. The, 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 the focus on today was really about the, the, mm. the leadership and so on. But, da but David, right. don't worry. Again, we've got a big series of of international stammtisches and opportunities to talk about ideas. And talking about newcomers in future will be much more about startups and new innovation and new However, ideas my and concern all. here, Aaron, was about women startups. Especially. Absolutely. And 100% with you. We've got two great leaders here who are not in startups right now, but I, I, I think. Uh, we, yeah, we, we, will, we, will, we will absolutely take that question into, the, into our future discussion. So don't, don't, we'll don't be very feel happy embarrassed. To give the Sorry ladies an opportunity yeah. to join non-profit uh, possibilities yeah absolutely on women entrepreneurship um and and ladies the, the question was about uh, about startup ideas platforms uh, in, in in germany and uh, extremely from a, from a female perspective and for for, for women startups and I, I i love the subject and i think we we'll, we we'll take it off and and, yeah. and use an opportunity to have a, a larger discussion on that extremely uh, in summer when we are planning the, the Newcomers Festival. And again, we, we do think newcomers in a new way, newcomers, not only the expats coming into the yeah. country, but also talking about new innovation and new ideas. Yeah. So, David, it's, it's definitely in, in our minds. Um, it, it is just shortly before the half hour we had planned for one and a half hours. So, so let me at least take the opportunity to really thank both of you for, for joining tonight. It has been an incredible discussion and I don't know how, how the audience feels. I feel extremely comfortable, relaxed. It's been, it's been an, an incredible, insightful and a wonderful conversation. I, I, I wished we could go on forever and I could probably come up with more ideas and so on. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining. Patricia, a, a pleasure and an honor to have had you in, in unfortunately, one of the last sessions. Uh, you, mm -hmm. You're leaving in, 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 in half a year's time. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we met too late, obviously, during your, <laughs> during your, yeah. your service here in Frankfurt. A, a pleasure to have you on, on, on you our so session much. tonight. Incredible insights, and thank you for joining. Corinna, mm -hmm. it, it's been a pleasure to see you again. As I said, I, I saw you like three days into your new role in a total in a total new surrounding and it's incredible to see how how you have how, how you have moved in how you are becoming a frankfurter in 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 germany and i'm i'm looking forward to many more discussions and and interactions uh, hopefully to see you again on one of our future stammtisch or or forms like this mm -hmm. um,
Thank, Thank you, you so much for you. having me. And it was so nice to virtually meet everyone. Exactly. I look forward to meeting hopefully in person. I know. I look forward it's to having coffee future. with having coffee with you all someday. <laughs> and, and again, new, newcomers, newcomers Stammtisch will give opportunities. Uh, we are all facing the challenges of, of the current situation. We're doing the best out of it. So for our next international Stammtisch coming up on 1st of March, normally we meet every first Monday of the month. Uh, we are taking the opportunity to do the best out of the situation. We are, we are moving to one of our partner cities. Uh, Frankfurt has a huge amount of partner cities in, in international. Most of the partner cities are similar in size. So for example, the US partner city is Philadelphia. Philadelphia. We, did, we did have an incredible session with the, with the Department of Commerce in Philadelphia. And I think with COVID, the one big, big advantage is we can, by moving virtually, we, we have the chance to meet some of our partner cities. And I think most of you will be very astonished to hear that Frankfurt has a, has a partner city, which is called Granada in Nicaragua, which is mm -hmm. tiny, compared to, uh, tiny compared to Frankfurt, but we have a very close relationship. And we've invited one of the major project drivers of that partnership to our next session. So we'll have an online discussion with uh, our partner in in, in uh, Granada, Granada in Nicaragua. So that is one of the upcoming activities. We are very optimistic that, and let's see, we'll always try our best. Uh, for mid of March, we are inviting you on a boat trip to on, on, on one of the ships uh, on the River Main. So uh, the Primus line will invite you to, to have a look at their fleet. Um, hopefully we can meet in person. There will be hygiene standards, anything of course. So once things open up, we will move back to, uh, back to regular meetings in person. And please follow our schedule. You can, you can join our newsletter. You can follow us on social media. Or if you have joined today by in the Eventbrite invite, uh, you will receive future uh, invitations for other, for other um, of our events. So please feel free to come and join us again. It's been an amazing session. We had up over, over 70 something uh, participants joining in today. Thank you for many interesting questions. And thank you, Thomas, for organizing and helping us and providing us with the, with the technology tonight. Uh, a wonderful session. Thank you to both of the ladies. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, for you. thank you for your thank great you. presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Have a good evening. Thank you too. And good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Auf Wiedersehen. Carlos, thank you. Nadine. Sandrine, good to have you. Laura, thank you for joining. Many familiar faces. Thank you for coming.